My name is Di Parkin, uh, and I'm from the Bristol Radical History Group. Um, so I'm introducing and chairing this meeting. Okay. It's like, a bit like, you know, having... We can waiting for actors, you know, yeah. to come in and then a round of applause and all of that. <laughs> yes, why don't you do that? We'll do the white poppies now. That'll save time. Um, speak into the thing. No, no, my shape. Uh, I'm Neil, and um, on behalf of Peace Pledge Union and the Stop the War movement, um, it is tradition at this time of year to wear a poppy. Most people wear a red poppy, but we also have the white poppy, which started a few years afterwards in the 1930s. The white poppy is for peace. The red poppy, quite rightly, says we will remember them, and we will remember them. But the white poppy, as well as looking back to what's happened in the past, the white poppy also looks forward to a world in peace. The funds raised by the white poppy and is a suggested donation of a pound per poppy. Uh, the, the funds raised go to the Stop the War Movement and the Peace Pledge Union. Um, we will never know, but we could be certain that our activities, our pressure, our lobbying of MPs, our commitment contributed to a historic moment in August 2013 when the British Parliament for the first time in 300 years voted against a war when it was proposed to send troops to Syria. Uh, the British MPs <coughs> voted against it, first time in 300 years. So at the end of the uh, event this evening, I'll be around probably at the back somewhere with white poppies for peace. Um, I've had a message on Friday from the Peace Pledge Union um, to say that demand for white poppies this year has been so great they haven't got any left. And that anybody that had applied for them and had got them, well done. Uh, but anybody that was still waiting, they would get them, but they were struggling to get them from the suppliers and they couldn't guarantee that the white poppies would arrive in time for Remembrance Day, which is uh, Tuesday week, the 11th of November. That has been the support for the white poppy this year and we all need to be very proud of that. Um, a couple of days ago, Sunday, I went out for a Sunday lunch. We were down in Somerset. I stopped in Wells and saw the uh, memorial stone to Harry Patch, Britain's last Tommy. And uh, it's a lovely stone, about yay high, uh, plaque about half a metre square saying about his service and, and rec uh, record and how he was the last Tommy. And how he, actually he, Harry Patch was very much against war. Uh, war is organised murder is the four words that I quote, many of us quote. Um, I will still keep on quoting jury. Iraq War 3 and wherever else the Westminster Wallies want to start another war. Um, but as I stood and looked at it, at, at the memorial stone to Harry Patch on the floor were two wreaths. One wreath of red poppies, one wreath of white poppies. I thought that was very appropriate. So I'll be at the, probably at the back there somewhere at the end uh, with white poppies for peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to have two speakers uh, this evening, and it, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce two socialist feminist speakers to speak on the issue of the issues relating to women in the First World War, because all too often war is presented as being a history of things that men do. First, we're going to have June Hannam, uh, who was who worked at UWE and has been a researcher on feminism and socialism between the 1880s uh, and the 1920s. And she's written uh, a work on Isabella Ford and written a book with Karen Hunt on socialist women. Uh, the, the talk that she's giving tonight is based on her forthcoming pamphlet, which is a Bristol Radical History pamphlet, uh, which is on the Bristol Independent Labour Party uh, socialists opposing the war. Unfortunately, we've been so bloody productive in the radical history group, but we are producing so many pamphlets that hers hasn't managed to get out by this the evening. What? Is that the but so we'll be out, coming out very soon. So uh, I'd like to introduce you to, to June Hannum. Thank you. I think I'll stand up actually. Can 
Can you, can you hear me? Yes. If I do that, okay. Um, well, I think as that introduction has implied, um, we've got a lot of commemorations about what happened in the First World War at the moment, but not so much about what happened with women, and certainly not very much about um, socialist women, or even socialist men, one might say. And I think it's particularly important to look at what um, socialist women and men were doing at a local level, because I think we'd all agree that that provides you with a way to get some kind of texture and understanding of the different ways in which um, people were involved in um, particularly anti-war activities, which is uh, the group I'm going to be looking at tonight. And I'm going to focus on the women, um, but the men were obviously integral to this as well. And um, in Bristol in particular, um, and Bristol is not often well represented in um, histories of uh, the socialist movement, even though it did have one of the largest independent Labour Party branches in the country, but it doesn't often figure in much of the literature. And so uh, this evening I want to highlight um, what Bristol socialists were doing, and I think in Bristol in particular they were some of the leading lights of the anti-war movement. Um, in some other areas, you might find a different set of alliances and allegiances, if you like, a different set of people who predominate. But I think in Bristol, it was um, a group of ILP members that I'd say <coughs> were particularly important. <coughs> and I think peace campaigners, um, it's important to actually think about uh, what they were doing before the war, because some of their friendship networks and working together um, occurred before the war. So I'm going to say something about the pre-war suffrage movement and then go on to talk about the peace campaigning afterwards. And um, I think what the, the other thing I'd like to say as a sort of context is that I think friendship between um, these various individuals that I'm going to be talking about in a minute is very important. And I've got a quote here. Let's see if I can work this. Oh. Um, yeah. From Liz Stanley, talking about the importance of friendship and, you know, what makes people... Why would you call certain people friends with others? And as she says, in political movements, it's... She's talking particularly about women. Who chooses to spend time with and to work with whom? Women who spend time working together in particular struggles and all, relate, all relied on each other's hospitality and all provided each other with mutual aid and support had a commitment to each other and this commitment I call friendship. And I think it was quite significant in Bristol that this group of activists in opposing the war were actually, I think, part of a friendship group and that helped to sustain them as they went along. Before I get on to my cast of characters, because I do have a cast of characters that I'm going to talk about, I'll just mention briefly um, the suffrage movement in East Bristol in particular just before the war. And I'm not going to talk about the main suffrage groups um, and the suffragettes and the constitutional groups, but it was a particular uh, moment in East Bristol that brought many of these people together. And this was an electioneering campaign in East Bristol in support of a Labour candidate and women's suffrage. And this was part of the national group, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, part of its new policy about supporting Labour candidates and also um, supporting women's suffrage. And they targeted East Bristol as one of the areas to give support to because there was a Liberal Cabinet Minister, Charles Hobhouse, in East Bristol. And so therefore, um, there is a big campaign for about a year and a bit um, to give support to the Labour candidate. And the first Labour candidate was Frank Shepherd, who was a socialist member of the um, city council. But then he was replaced by a very significant figure, Walter Ailes, in 1913. And Walter Ailes was a particular supporter of women's suffrage anyway. And so you get a big campaign in Bristol which brings together men and women in support of women's suffrage and puts women's suffrage and labour quite inextricably linked together, which I think is important. So I've now got my cast of characters for you who all come together before the war. Um, the first ones I need to identify are Walter Ailes and Bertha Ailes, his wife. 
I was very excited to get this photo which Dawn Dyer found for me in uh, the Bristol Reference Library because I had not come across one of them together before. And I think Walter Ailes is an extremely important and, again, often neglected figure in um, histories of the socialist and labour movement. He came to Bristol in 1909 um, to be organising secretary for the Independent Labour Party, the main Bristol branch. And he was an engineer by training and his father had been a railway porter and he'd been active in politics in Birmingham before he came to Bristol to take up the post. And I'm not going to say a great deal about him tonight because we're focusing on the women, but he was a very... Um, uh, he was very successful in um, his methods of trying to build up the Bristol branch. But his wife Bertha is extremely important in her own right. And she was active both in um, suffrage politics, women's politics, and also in the ILP. And when she came to Bristol, she was part-time organiser in the South West for the Women's Labour League, which was the group that tried to involve working class women in support for the Labour Party. Um, she was a member of the executive committee of the Women's Labour League, so she went to national meetings as well. And I think throughout this you find that local people are not just focused locally, they're also doing things nationally as well. So there is a kind of interplay all the time between the local and the national. And she was also president of the Bristol Women's Labour League, but at the same time, she's active in the local ILP. She often chairs meetings. She goes as a delegate to the Labour Representation Committee. So she's a significant figure as well as Walter Ailes. And she also helps, I think, to liven up the local Women's Labour League and get them to express more interest in suffrage, um, which they hadn't been doing so much before she came. Um, but unfortunately, just before the war, she was diagnosed as having a heart complaint and she was also pregnant and had a baby in November of 1914, uh, 13, sorry. And so she kind of withdraws from the same sort of activity because of both health and having the baby. So in a way, she's a significant figure before the war, but less so afterwards. Um, the next person who's also an incomer to Bristol is... Annie Townley, and again, this is the only picture I can get of her, which is after the war, and she's right in the middle there of that group of women. It's at a Morpeth by-election in 1923. <clears throat> and she wings her way into Bristol because she's an organiser for the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies for the election fighting fund of, um, of their new policy about supporting Labour candidates. And what they used to do was to um, employ more working class women to carry out this policy because they felt they could relate more to the Labour movement. And Annie Townley has been said she was quite significant in going up to um, the north of England amongst the miners and helping to try and persuade them to support women's suffrage in 1913. Well, she comes down to um, Bristol to lead this campaign for women's suffrage. And I ought to mention she's married to Ernest Townley, who was a textile worker from Blackburn. They have two young daughters. And it's quite difficult to know what Ernest did once he got to Bristol. I don't know what job he did, if he had one at all. Um, because in the 1911 census, they're still in Blackburn and he's still listed as a textile worker. And he does turn up in the minutes of the Independent Labour Party where he's active, uh, but it's hard to know what kind of work he does uh, once he's here. And she becomes close to Walter and Bertha Ailes. They all work together in this local suffrage movement and they actually live a few doors away from each other, which I think must um, compound their friendship. Um, I've got somewhere, that's right, the Townleys lived at number four and the Ailes at number 12, um, Ashley Road, I think it was. So, they, uh, Station Road, sorry, in, near Ashley Hill. So, um, they live very close together. Now, a very different sort of character that's part of this group is my next one, whom you might have heard of, Mabel Tothill. And... She's very different because she comes from a very different class background to the others. And she, was, um, she came to Bristol in the 1890s, and she'd been the youngest daughter of a managing director of a 
blue starch and black lead factory. Okay? And they came from Hull, um, that's where he had his factory. And when Mabel comes to Bristol, she joins the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, which was a much more middle-class organisation. And in Bristol, I probably should have explained, um, by the time you get to just before the war, they're very liberal in their sympathies, and they don't, many of the leading members don't approve of the pact of the Labour Party, and three of them actually resign. So when Annie Townley comes to Bristol, she more or less works through a separate group, the East Bristol Women's Suffrage Society, okay? And that's where Mabel Tothill is very active as well. But I can ask, answer more detailed questions on this, should you wish. Um, anyway, Mabel is a member of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, and she pretty soon gets quite involved in East Bristol, around the Barton Hill area. Um, so, in common with other women of her class, she gets involved in voluntary social action outside the home, and she was the honorary secretary of the East Bristol branch of the Civic League, which arose from the Charity Organisation Society, and um, it was trying to be a bridge between voluntary action and the state. And at the same time, though, she wants to work more directly with working class people. So when her father dies, she uses a legacy that she gets from him and from some other female relative um, to help fund the university settlement at Barton Hill, which is where she lives with two other women, and they're all Quakers. So that's the other thing to note about her. Um, and so... Her activities in um, the east of the city bring her into contact with members of the ILP, and I can't find precisely when she joined the ILP, but she is a member before the war and during all this um, suffrage activity. Um, a final person on my list whom I don't have a photograph of is um, Mrs Higgins, who again is a working class woman, and I sort of deduce that I think her name is Hannah Higgins, because nowhere in the literature they always call her Mrs. Um, but given the fact that her husband, Tommy, was very active in the ILP and was a great supporter of Walter Ailes, um, and he's described at some point as having two young daughters and being a worker. So I've worked out who I think they are from the census, but I could be entirely wrong. But so for now, I'm going to call her Hannah Higgins. And the two of them were in their 30s. Um, Thomas Henry was a coach painter. They lived in St. George with two daughters aged six and four. And Hannah Higgins is active in the Bristol ILP. She was nominated as vice chair of the Bristol branch in 1913. She was vice president of the Bristol Women's Labour League. And... She was active in this campaign before the war. So I won't say much more about the suffrage. I'm going to keep my eye on the time as well because um, we haven't even got to the war and this is what happens, isn't it? So, well, at the outbreak of war, we've got this group already working together, already friends with each other, already working for suffrage and for labour and they're working in single-sex groups but also in mixed-sex organisations, um, obviously the ILP. And that's a different thing to many women who were, say, in the suffrage movement, who were not necessarily used to working in mixed-sex groups. And, I mean, there is... I went to a conference where somebody said that Helena Swanick, who was very active in the... Uh, becomes a peace campaigner, found it quite difficult initially to get involved in one of the mixed-sex groups because she wasn't used to working with men as well as women. So as I'm sure most people know, when war is declared, the ILP as a party... Um, opposes the war, or although there is some ambivalence in the way it opposes the war, which I won't go into here, I mean, Keir Hardy is kind of opposing the war, but saying, now it's started, we have to carry on fighting it, for example, um, and so there are differences in how the ILP might look at the war. And in Bristol, as elsewhere, ILP members do make a variety of different decisions. So some of them actually, some of the men join up and volunteer. And there's some poignant moments in the minutes where they actually send chocolate to these men at the front, you know, and get a message back saying thanks for thinking of us and stuff like this. Others eventually disagreed with the stand taken and left the ILP. But those who did stay in the ILP and oppose the war tended to be fat pacifists, which not everybody was in the Labour movement, but that was a predominant strain in the Bristol ILP. Um, 
And so on the one level, the war could be said to have weakened the ILP. It does lose lots of members because of the absence of so many men for various reasons. But it did bring some new recruits, and I'm going to mention one of these, whose name is Lucy Cox. Sorry, that's Mrs. Higgins. I'm always forgetting my slides. Okay. Uh, Lucy Cox. Now, she is a new recruit and joins in 1916, and she lives in Canesham. She was a young school teacher in Canesham and was secretary of the Canesham branch, but she also is very attracted by Walter Ailes's campaigns in Bristol and works quite closely with him. And what I think is one of the interesting things about her is that much later on, um, she has an affair with Jim Middleton, who was the General Secretary of the Labour Party, and they eventually get married in the late 1930s. And as Lucy Middleton, she stands for Plymouth in 1945 and is elected as an MP. But she starts her life in Bristol, and she claimed, or in, in the area, and she later claimed that she became involved in politics to make the world a better place. Those were the two things that made me join the Labour Party, poverty and war. So she's someone who's joining as a young woman in the middle of the war and sees the opposition to war as, as important for why she becomes a socialist. So, okay, there's a number of groups in the war, as I'm sure you know, that took a kind of oppositional stand to war and that had some very similar aims and objectives. Um, what they tended to stand for was the democratic control of foreign policy, the end of secret diplomacy, uh, they wanted a negotiated peace, a just and non-punitive peace settlement, and they wanted a peacekeeping body to be set up after the war. And so, given the fact they have very similar aims and objectives, you find women and men working across um, many of them, although they might prioritise where they put their energies. And so, here's some of the groups, in case you're not familiar with them. There's the Independent Labour Party itself, of course, there's the Union of Democratic Control, set up in 1914, which brought together socialist, radical liberals and suffragists, and which had local branches. There was the No Conscription Fellowship, which, as its name implies, was there to uh, particularly coordinate activities against conscription. And then later on, of course, it supports conscientious objectors. And again, there's an important local branch in Bristol. And there's, all, um, sorry, there's also the Women's International League, which was established in October 1915 and largely came out of those suffrage workers who could not support um, the war effort like their main organisations and therefore they formed the Women's International League. And again, there was a branch in Bristol and the branch in Bristol brought together uh, both ILP socialist women and also some of the more middle class liberal um, uh, National Union of Women's Suffrage Women from before the war, and they also work together. So there's the Bristol IL, uh, WIL branch as well as the ILP. And I've got just a few slides about this, largely because I think this is funny. And this is, um, you have a cartoon on the right. When they were having the Peace Congress at The Hague, from which the Women's International League was formed, a number of women had visas to go to the conference, but actually they um, cancelled shipping in the North Sea, and so they couldn't go. And they have here um, a picture of uh, a woman who's sitting on the, uh, the quay at Tilbury, having a little fit of the egg, which is obviously the Hague. And of course, it comes from the Daily Express, so you can imagine uh, why it's um, you know, the way it is. But what I think is interesting is that this woman is depicted exactly the way they used to characterize suffragists. They're almost the same. They've always got, I don't know why they always have a feather in their hat, but they do. They've nearly always got an umbrella. They're nearly always dumpy and yes, round glasses. Um, sometimes if they're spinsters, they're very skinny and look a bit dried up, but they still have the umbrellas. Um, so I think you can see that they're kind of carrying on some of these characteristics of um, these peaceset women, the same as before. Um, now, the Sturge sisters are some of the more middle-class women from the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies that join the Women's International League, along with people like the Fries. There are a number of families, and of course it's partly because they're Quakers. And so they um, share in common 
with many members of the ILP because, as I'm going to say in a minute, religion is quite an important underpinning for why socialists as well as um, some suffragists had arguments against the war. I forget what my next slide is, so I have to have a look. It's not there yet. Um, so anyway, the, I, I just thought you'd, you'd like to see the Sturge sisters because they do connect quite a lot with people like uh, Mabel Tothill and um, Walter Ailes. <coughs> So one of the things we need to think about is why there were so many different groups, given that these particular groups share very similar objectives. They share similar methods as well, in that they don't set out to um, undermine the war effort per se. They're, they're looking to a negotiated peace and, and changing things for the future. So it's a kind of slightly different way than you might have some um, oppositionists to war. As we'll hear about more from Sheila, they... they the, the women here don't get put in jail, I have to say. Um, okay, so what arguments are used? Well, socialists draw attention, obviously, to the relationship between capitalism, profiteering, and imperialism as lying um, behind the outbreak of war. But in other respects, their arguments are similar to uh, radical liberals who oppose the war, um, and this could enable people to work together, as I've said before. Um, for a core of Bristol ILP members, as I've mentioned, religion is very important. Walter Ailes in particular stated on numerous occasions, too many to mention, he, he wrote an enormous number of pamphlets and leaflets on this, that Christian pacifism underpinned his convictions. And he says, since my belief is that God who gave life alone has the right to take it. He believed in a, quote, worldwide brotherhood and he could not and would not kill. Ailes had been a Methodist lay preacher, and he eventually becomes Quaker. Mabel Tothill was a Quaker. Lucy Cox was also um, motivated by religion. And they all come together in an organization called the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which is based on, again, Christian socialist principles. And Ailes is actually one of the um, founding members and is on the central committee of this. And he is also on the central committee of the No Conscription Fellowship. So he is a significant person in the peace movement, uh, as I say, not just in Bristol, but elsewhere as well. Annie Townley, on the other hand, while expressing her hatred of war on numerous occasions, does not refer to religion as underlying her pacifism. But along with many other pre-war suffragists, did see her commitment to peace as linked to her feminist principles. So the Women's International League argued that women had not taken any part in bringing the war because they didn't have the vote. They also felt they weren't combatants, so therefore they were in a different position to men. And they also emphasised that women's role as mothers uh, meant that they were more likely to desire peace than men. I mean, these are controversial issues one could debate. Um, and Hannah Higgins expressed some of these views at the Women's Labour League annual conference when she said that war was the greatest setback to progress and social reform. The destruction of life was an insult to the mothers of all nations. The enemy were God's people as well as ourselves. In an impassioned speech to the Women's Labour League, she pleaded, let us tell the men that we will not bring babies into the world to be killed. They should tell the conscriptionists that unless they could have free-born babies, they wouldn't have them born slaves. Um, and so I think from all of this, one could see that socialist men and women don't see peace in passive terms as simply the avoidance of war, but as something that would lay the foundations for a different kind of society based on human rights and a dignified life for all. For Ailes, for example, the destruction of militarism would mean the way would be clear for the establishment of a new society based on the principles of love and sanctity of human life. So what activities did they actually engage in? Well, most of the time they're putting, attempting to put pressure on either the government or the public at large through um, lots of talking, um, indoors, outdoor meetings, um, writing pamphlets, writing letters to the press. At different phases in the war, they have different um, emphases. So to the at the beginning, they're opposing recruitment. Then they link with many others in the labor movement to oppose conscription. And then, of course, there's support for conscientious objectors because conscription obviously is brought in. And often this is seen as much more moderate than um, actually trying to hinder the war effort itself. But as peace campaigners became more vocal, they were subject to a great deal of hostility. So even these so-called more moderate groups 
um, did have a difficult time of it. Uh, their meetings were broken up in very hostile ways, and um, they suffered a great deal of personal attack in the press. So I'm looking for my, um, I'm only looking for my PowerPoint so I can remember when I have the next thing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so they do come in for a lot of stick. And interesting, Mabel Tothill tends to come in for a considerable amount of criticism, perhaps because she was a more middle-class woman and was quite well known in the area for her social work. But at one point, um, when the Congress at The Hague was going to be held, the Women's Peace Congress, in the local press, they criticised this as being ill-conceived, pro-German and based on emotion rather than reason. So Mabel Tothill then, with three other Quaker members of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, Marion Hill, Maria Bella Fry and Marion Pease, write to the Western Daily Press to complain it had been misleading to imply women were proposing that the Allies should ask Germany for peace terms. Instead, they were calling on the belligerent powers to state what terms of peace they were aiming for. They claimed women wanted a just peace, not any old peace, and not a German one. And they wanted to reassure readers that women were not animated by a passing impulse, but their actions were carefully considered and based on deep-rooted principles. Later in the year, the University of Bristol also came under attack for being pro-German. A petition was sent to the city council complaining about pacifist propaganda amongst the staff, while a Dr. Geraldine Hodgson expressed similar views in a letter to the press in which she criticised staff at uh, at the settlement at Barton Hill, including Mabel Tothill, for using the settlement, quote, for semi-secret peace activities. <laughs> this caused a flurry of excitement in the press. Letters came backwards and forwards. The editor of the Western Daily Press wrote to Mabel Tothill for an explanation, and she replied to reassure readers that she now had no connection with the settlement. She apologised for writing a letter on its newspaper on behalf of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and denied she'd carried out any peace propaganda amongst work girls at the training centre that had been set up there. And the editor then accepted her word on this and praised the work she'd done on, in, in a sort of social capacity. And there were lots of other things, like the bishop wrote to the paper as well and um, all this kind of thing. So university staff then, as, as probably later, were always under attack. But I think Mabel Tottle became... You know, it, it's quite a lot for her to get this kind of attack in the press. Ten minutes I've got. Okay, I shall rush. Um, towards the end of the war, um, these activities were expanded rather because I think many um, women who were in the Women's International League if they were socialist women, they felt that the International League was a bit too moderate in its attitudes. They wanted to mobilise more working class women. And so they're it, from 1917, there is a campaign called the Women's uh, Peace Crusade. It was initiated by Helen Crawford, who was um, a Glasgow ILP member. And Bristol was one of those that had a branch. This is a, um, a contemporary uh, poster uh, commemorating the Women's Peace Crusade. And there were 70-odd branches, and Bristol had one of those. And Annie Townley was very important in um, generating support for the Women's Peace Crusade in Bristol. And um, it does appear on there. It's, it's sort of near the front, and I'm sorry, it's probably a bit small. Um, so I'll whiz by that bit. Um, I just wanted to very briefly say that what I think the war also did was bring some new roles for women within the ILP. And they become far more important in actually running the branch. And I think this is often forgotten, that with so many men either away fighting or when they start to be arrested as conscientious objectors, um, there's no one left uh, to do all the day-to-day -day work. And so women were often called on to fill positions in the branch. Annie Townley becomes temporary secretary of the Totterdown Ward, for example. She was also significant in keeping the branch going when Walter Ailes was imprisoned. And she took on the role of organising secretary when Ailes was imprisoned. Mabel Tottill is often the chair of the ILP. Um, Hannah Higgins um, goes to uh, other... She, she's often chair and also goes as a representative to other Labour groups. And Annie Townley goes along with Bertha Ailes to the various prisons where Walter Ailes is, is imprisoned. 
um, to get his views, take them back to the branch. So there's a lot of toing and froing between the women and these men. Um, the other significant role that's taken on by these women during the war, there are many others, but I'm skirting over this, is that Mabel Tothill takes up the controversial cause of supporting conscientious objectors, and she's secretary of the Joint Committee for Conscientious Objectors in Bristol. Um, it's set up by the ILP to support them, and she writes numerous pamphlets and leaflets detailing who's imprisoned, and also um, detailing some of the ill treatment that prisoners got, especially in Hawfield Jail and so on. And so um, these women take on significant roles, and I'm going to almost rush to afterwards. I'm going to miss some of the others. I think I just ought to mention some of the emotional traumas of all this. Uh, people like Hannah Higgins, Bertha Ailes, they have husbands imprisoned for a lot of the war and they have to travel backwards and forwards. Bertha Ailes had this very small child and her health, her health was poor as well. And for um, Annie Tanley, her husband Ernest has problems in the war and I do wonder sometimes whether this affects his ability to work later on because there was a report in the Labour leader that said that her husband Ernest was damaged when he was knocked about at a demonstration in London and that he'd never been quite well since. And towards the end of the war, he is actually arrested as a conscientious objector. And you can get some idea of the life of a married couple in the ILP. He asked if he can have um, 24 hours grace because his wife's at the Labour Party annual conference and he wants to see her before he goes to jail. And he's granted 24 hours before he has to go in so he can say goodbye to her. Um, right, I shall now come to a conclusion. In the immediate post-war years, you still do tend to get an alliance between the Women's International League and the ILP. You still got women doing cross-class um, sort of organising, getting the million teats for babies, fight the famine council, and so on. Uh, but this wasn't to last because the Women's International League nationally does not agree in the end to affiliate to the Labour movement. And so, in, well, nationally and in Bristol, you tend to find that the ILP members, as you would expect, men, as, women as well as men, uh, become much more concerned to pursue their goals through the Labour Party, which has come out of the war uh, much strengthened than before. In the early 20s, uh, women continue to chair the Independent Labour Party branch. Annie Townley chairs till 1920, then she's succeeded by Mabel Tothill. Yeah, I'm going to finish in five minutes. <laughs> in three, probably. Uh, Lucy Cox and Bertha Ailes attend various national conferences of the ILP, and Lucy Cox was a delegate to numerous Labour Party conferences, took part in propaganda meetings, and was secretary of the South West Divisional Council of the ILP. She also helped Ailes in his election campaigning for North Bristol, where she acted for a short time as a part-time agent. So these women were, continue to be very active in the ILP. They were concerned to keep the needs of working class women to the forefront, and through the local paper Bristol North Forward, have a column where they're trying to get women more involved in politics. But as I said, for the most part, war did confirm that for socialist women in the ILP, they needed to work with and through the Labour Party to get social change. And uh, the, it is significant, though, that although all these people have been peace campaigners and or conscientious objectors, it doesn't appear to have kept them away from being selected as candidates after the war. And I think it's perhaps because the Labour Party here needed the ILP's organisation. It didn't have a really big trade union machine in support. And so, Mabel Tothill selected as a Labour candidate after the war and becomes the first female um, elected onto Bristol City Council um, in 1919. Uh, she stood in Eastern, well, she stood in St Paul's but wasn't elected, and then she stands in Eastern Ward, although she was defeated 18 months later. Ailes was, of course, elected as MP for Bristol North in 1923. But the vibrant group who'd worked so closely together in the Bristol ILP, using it as their base to influence the local Labour Party, didn't operate in quite the same way after the mid-1920s. After she was unable to gain her council seat, Mabel Totter was co-opted to the Education Subcommittee and addressed various Labour meetings, but was never quite so central again. Walter Ailes and Lucy Cox, in particular, became more and more committed to peace activism. Ailes resigned as chairman of the Bristol ILP in 1924, 
didn't stand for re-election to the city council in 26, and in 1925, both he and Lucy Cox moved to London to take paid positions in the No More War movement, um, which they'd helped to establish. And so they leave the city. Now, Annie Townley, who does remain in the city and remains, I think, a key figure in the interwar period and hardly ever gets a mention, but she has to withdraw from active involvement in the ILP in 1920 because she's chosen to be the Labour Party's woman organiser for the South West, uh, a post she holds till the 1940s. So she's a very key figure, but she's now a paid employee of the Labour Party. She does attempt to keep highlighting women's needs, but you know when um, her loyalty has to be to the Labour Party because they're employing her. So. She can't rock the boat too much um, after the early 20s. So I will stop there, just saying I think there is an interesting group of men and women in the ILP during the war in Bristol. Um, they take a leading role in anti-war activism, and I think they're significant in the labour movement just after the war. And I think they probably become a bit lost from view and need more attention. Thank you. Hold your questions uh, till after Sheila has spoken. Sheila and Julian are going to change seats uh, and we're going to hear from Sheila. I haven't got a proper thing like this, but you can see these. Putting these here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a moment. And, well, this isn't important. And I've got some leaflets also <coughs> because they're going to do this Alice Wielding book again. Okay, but before Sheila begins, I should properly introduce Sheila Rowbottom. And if you if you say writings on socialist feminism and history, then I think you're saying Sheila Rowbottom, uh, who was active in the women's liberation movement in the 1970s. Oh, right. Sorry. Uh, Sheila has been active uh, since the 1970s when she was a, 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 a leading figure in the women's liberation movement and has written histories uh, on uh, various socialist feminist figures. And I've lost my notes, so I can't, can't locate this. <laughs> She's, uh, her book is also for, is going to be reprinted as she her book about Annie Wilden, about whom she's going to speak now. Thanks. Well, um, I, I found out about Alice Wilden um, in the 1970s when I was in bed with flu. And now I'm a pensioner, I have the jab, so I don't get flu very much, but I was always getting flu <laughs> in my youthful days. And being in bed with flu, I read. Raymond Chaloner's The Origins of British Bolshevism while I was <laughs> lying there. And I was really, I mean, it's a really interesting book and I recommend it to people, but I was fascinated to find the story of a woman in Derby who kept a second-hand uh, clothes shop called Alice Wielden, who was um, accused of... Um, uh, conspiring to assassinate Lloyd George in the, uh, 1916 and she was tried for this and uh, sent to, to prison for 10, ten years. Um, she had been a member of the Women's Social and Political Union, that's the uh, Pankhurst Militant Suffrage Wing. She um, didn't agree with their support for the war, the leaders' support for the war, apart from Sylvia Pankhurst, who was anti-war. And she joined um, the uh, No Conscription Fellowship, which June mentioned, an organization uh, which was opposed to the conscription, um, which had been introduced um, to say that uh, you you had, to, you had to fight. And so the men who were opposed to fighting became uh, people who uh, were resisting the war. And Alice Wielden was part of a network uh, 
which supported them. She uh, got involved in um, a, what was called the, uh, a plot to assassinate Lord George through uh, an agent provocateur called Alex, his pseudonym was Alex Gordon. And he uh, was working for a small intelligence unit which was linked to the Ministry of Munitions. During the First World War, as sure you know, that it became exceedingly difficult to uh, oppose the war and it, the situation in every way was very oppressive. But there was also a great multiplication of um, intelligence units, small intelligence units. Um, often uh, with these kind of John Buchanish kind of characters um, working for them from the army. And that was the organization that Alex Gordon was connected to. Um, <laughs> most sinister of this plot, the aspect of this plot, was that she was said to have been planning to assassinate the Prime Minister um, with a, a poisoned arrow while he was playing golf. <laughs> this was really um, sacrilege that you not only tried to assassinate the Prime Minister, but when he was playing golf. And of course, as the militant suffragettes had already attacked the golf courses. So, um, you know, this was sort of adding to the Daily Express and Daily Mail horror of all this. Um, the original charge against her had been that she was going to try and assassinate King George V and also um, uh, Arthur Henderson, who was the Labour leader who um, was supporting the war. Um, but these were dropped, presumably, because even in the paranoid circumstances of 1916-17, they were seen as too fantastical. Um, as I said, she was imprisoned. And so was her daughter, Winnie Mason, and her, her, Winnie Mason's husband, Alfred Mason, who was a, a chemist in Southampton and who provided the poison which Alice Wielden had obtained because she claimed this was because she was going to use, it was going to be used to poison dogs who were guarding the young men in internment camps. Um, after the war, she was released on an amnesty by Lloyd George. Um, well, I did a play about Alice Wilton, and it was the drama, really, of the case that got me um, first going, the st actual story. But as I did the research for the play, I became really interested in the um, background circumstances and there are two aspects which the, the essay that I wrote which was published with the play focus on. One is the, the kinds of networks that June was talking about. Those, um, the ways in which that, the, I mean anyone who's been involved in kind of movement politics knows that the left functions so much through these networks and um, that is, you can see that coming out of the evidence that comes out over the trial. But the other uh, area that I was really interested in was the whole dilemma of the state and how to um, think about the state because this group who were involved in opposing the war had a really strong strand of anti-statist uh, leftism because they'd experienced such a coercive state. And yet, at the same time, in certain ways, the kinds of welfare measures that came, which Labour was later to take on board, which came from uh, Lloyd George's uh, First World War policies, were also welfare policies that did benefit um, some working class women. So there's a, there was a, a, a whole area of ambivalence around the state. Um, I am... Um, really um, was fascinated to see the kinds of fluidity that existed in Derby. And I'm sure, you know, whenever you look at any local left, you find that. I'm now putting on my glasses like the, <laughs> the woman in the picture. <laughs> my eyesight is going in older age. Um, this uh, fluidity is evident in 
um, finding out through the um, kinds of material that came up through the trial, which were uh, deposited in the public record office, some of the material, though not all, and also kept in the private collection of the conservative politician Lord Milner, which in his papers in Oxford. Um, so it's possible to see this world through the letters that were intercepted by the police of a group of socialists and feminists in a provincial town. Alice Wilden, who was born in 1866, was a mother of four, and she ran a second-hand clothes shop. She used to speak uh, and also sell newspapers in the local marketplace, and she was active in the left of the Independent Labour Party, like the people that June's mentioning, um, but also had sympathies to revolutionary socialism and to um, the syndicalist left politics that were circulating. Her daughter, Hetty, um, who was accused of also being in the plot but was not sent to prison, was a school teacher, and she was a socialist, active in the No Conscription Fellowship. Um, and she was also uh, known to have what were called advanced views on women and marriage. <laughs> <laughs> the eldest daughter, who I didn't really mention very much in my uh, book, but she was called Nelly. She worked in the co-op shop, and she was also in the Marxist organisation, the Socialist Labour Party. Um, the other daughter, as I mentioned, Winnie, lived in Southampton and was married to um, Alfred uh, Mason. And um, so they, you can see there, there's a group of people who are not part of the sort of upper middle class intellectual elite, but they're thinking people. Um, they have very radical uh, left-wing views, and they are reading all the left and feminist uh, periodicals and uh, things like Bernard Shaw's Mrs. Warren's Profession. So they, they, they read and they think and um, they're politically active. And they're subversive not simply because they want a change in the politics and the economic structure of society, but because they really want different kinds of relationships and different kinds of uh, forms of living and daily life. And that spanned right through through the, through the ILP people and also these um, uh, ones who were connected to the Socialist Labour Party, like Nelly. Um, after I spoke on a local radio programme, uh, Nora Roma sent me a copy of her father's diary. He, that was a man called Reuben Farrow, who was a railway clerk. And he was a pacifist and active with Alice Wilden in the Derby ILP. But he had accepted work that was necessary for the war effort. And um, uh, Alice was very contemptuous of that she didn't approve. She thought you should be an absolute resistor to the war. Um, his diaries reveal the kinds of disputes and difficulties that were arising in the ILP, just like June describes, but also um, things like uh, vegetarianism and um, an effort towards some personal democracy between the sexes in organising a babysitting rota. Now that was pretty modern in the, <laughs> the First World War. Uh, and that's uh, Reuben Farrow and his wife were involved in that. Um, at the time uh, when uh, Alice Wilden was being approached by the police by Alex Gordon. Well, he's an intelligence agent. Um, the Wilden household um, became a kind of linking, uh, informal linking place where um, opponents of World War I and uh, some of the people involved in the leadership of the shop stewards movement um, encountered each other. Um, this was a period when the shop stewards in industry, in munitions, were resisting the de-skilling of wartime production methods. Uh, the employers were really taking advantage of the situation, 
to restructure industry, not simply to increase productivity, but also to break the craft power of skilled men. And among the politically conscious shop stewards, there were people who were interested in wider issues than simply the workplace. So they were interested in um, uh, anti-imperialist politics, they're supporting Irish resistance to Britain, they're um, also aware of inequality at work. This is solemnly reported by the police, uh, the intelligence agents, I must call them. Um, they realize, too, that there's a, a problem in having a politics that's completely confined to the workplace, particularly in relation to women in the community. So they were trying to think through how do you get beyond the workplace? How do you um, take up issues that relate to consumers and women in the community? And these are things that I kept coming across again and again and again, and they're all little scattered things that I've found in my life, and people are nodding, so they've found them too. And yet, you never sort of see it all put together, because people usually look at syndicalism, shop stewards in one block, and feminists and suffrage and women in another. Um, one of the uh, men who was a key figure is a man called Willie Paul, who... Um, was later to be active in the Coventry shop stewards movement. And he got in contact with Alice Wielding when he came to Derby because he was sort of lying low and producing the socialist from a village. The socialist is the journal of the Socialist Labour Party. Um, and he uh, wanted advice from Alice Wielding on how to set up a, clothes, a second-hand clothes store in the market to live off. So Willie Paul, who I was told by a man called Harry Young, was very personable. He was a kind of, like this kind of figure, I think, a rather sort of tall and handsome chap. And he came uh, to do this newspaper in, in Derby. And he um, was also writing a book on the state. Um, he had a friend from Glasgow called John S. Clark, who also visited. He is a very interesting person who um, Ray Chaloner was also interested in, it, because not only was he a poet, but he was a lion tamer. He'd been a lion tamer, as well as being active in the Socialist Labour Party. And most interesting to me was that he'd been greatly influenced by a woman called Jane Clapton, who pops up in my life on different times. She was very interesting. From the 1880s, she'd been advocating free love and birth control, and she was influenced by Robert Owen. She was from an older generation, and she gets involved in the suffrage movement up in Edinburgh, and she has this great impact on uh, John S. Clarke. And then, finally, there is Arthur McManus, who is this, he was a very tiny, skinny guy. He, he was from Glasgow, and he'd been actually banned from Glasgow. I mean, the state banned him from <laughs> Glasgow. And so they, he was sent to work at Cunards in Liverpool, but he was a kind of pimpernel figure, and he kept giving the state the slip and visiting Derby to see Paul but also because it was a munition centre. Um, he was, uh, had been sympathetic to the militant suffragettes. He also was um, a great admirer of James Connolly in Ireland. And in 1919, he married Hetty Wielden. That's the, the daughter who wasn't put sent to prison. Um, though he does not appear to have known in 1916. Um, fatally, though, he did meet Alex Gordon in 1916, and fatally for everybody, he gave him a letter of support. So he, I mean, he was, it wasn't only Alice Wielden who was taken in by this uh, police <coughs> intelligence agent. The material on the Wielden case really then reveals this rebellious network that comes into being. And in the extreme circumstances of the opposition to the war, it brings a whole load of people together. Um, 
So um, McManus from Scotland and J.T. Murphy from uh, Sheffield found themselves working with the syndicalists in the North London Herald League and with Marxist opponents of the war in Hackney who were in the British Socialist Party and the Herald League also worked with Sylvia Pankhurst Workers Socialist Federation in East London and were in contact with James Connolly in Ireland. And the networks extended internationally too. Um, James Connolly had been in contact with the anarcho-syndicalist organisation, the Industrial Workers of the World, known as the IWW or Wobblies, um, who some of you may be familiar with. I know their banner appears here in Bristol on marches. Um, and they uh, were helping to smuggle conscientious objectors across the Atlantic during the <coughs> First World War. And the IWW had also been um, uh, infiltrated by this uh, same Alex Gordon guy in London. So the anti-war movement means that the independent Labour Party left is interacting with this more explicitly revolutionary left. And scurrying around after the left-wing rebels and treading acrimoniously on each other's toes were several intelligence agencies, including our one, which um, traps Alice Wielden from the, this is from the Ministry of Munitions, and it has the most peculiar name called PMS2. And I, well, there is um, a historian of intelligence, writes on intelligence, called, I found it, uh, Nicholas Hiley, and uh, he, in a, there's a very interesting article by him in Intelligence and National Security in September 1986 um, called The Rise and Fall of PMS2. And he's, he really uh, has spent his whole life studying um, these intelligence groups around this period. And he's, um, he's also got very, in, he's always been, you know, very interested in, in the Alice Wielden story. Well, there's a very panicky document in the Milner papers about how there's this great shortage of um, uh, munitions and um, the shop stewards were organizing and the um, documents argues that all the disintegrating and reactionary elements in the state, such as the pacifists, the SLP, the syndicalists, the IWW, the NCF, the Sinn Feiners, the UDC, that's the Union of Democratic Control that June mentioned, um, the militant section of the ILP flocked to serve under the same bar banner. It's absolute kind of horror, all these people they think are all kind of cohering. And they thought the most sinister figures were J.T. Murphy, the man from Sheffield, Arthur McManus, Willie Paul, Walter Hill, who was a gay shop steward from Sheffield, and a friend of the socialist Edward Carpenter, who's another <laughs> preoccupation of mine. Uh, and a man called Dave Ramsey, who was a steward from Leicester. Well, the leader of the unit, the PMS2, was a rather dim right-wing Tory called William Melville Lee. Now, surprise, surprise, he has a brother who's called Arthur Hamilton Lee, who had, as a conservative, who'd served on a, with Lloyd George at the Ministry um, of the uh, munitions, and then later moves off to the war office. And uh, he'll be interested to know that it's he who gave checkers to the nation. And another strange coincidence is that the first prime minister who ever occupies it in 1921 was none other than Lloyd George. <laughs> <laughs> so there's William Melville Lee, and he adds to the list this already long list of people who are all cohering together, the British Socialist Party, the Women's Social and Political Union, well, sections of them were being very patriotic, so that's a bit odd, the Clyde Workers Committee, the Central Labour College, and the Plebeians, that's the plebs, who, is, uh, who are an ed a left-wing educational group. 
Well, under Lee, there is this adventurer kind of figure called Lieutenant de Valder, who was always well entertained by Douglas Vickers and other munitions employers as he roamed about the land doing his scouting for lefties. Um, his equivalent to a, a sort of NCO was a burly macho figure called Herbert Booth, who was known as Comrade Bert when he was undercover. And he in turn employed, because they kind of, it was like the original outsourcing. They kind of employed their own types. And we have this Alex Gordon pseudonym guy, who I, there are pictures of him in this book, but he's, he has this long black greasy hair and he just looks like a stage villain and indeed he he had been a stage hypnotist <laughs> he's a very funny person he hung around in the socialist movement he was a spiritualist and he also um, uh, Nicholas Hyde's found had uh, a long history of mental illness and had actually been um, declared criminally insane. So he's the, he's the agent who um, gets Alice Wielden and also convinced um, uh, the um, Arthur McManus. So he, he, he did have a capacity to convince people. Um, he, the M, he, even MI5 didn't know his real name. They thought his real name was um, called um, uh, Vivian, Francis Vivian, but actually uh, Nicholas Hyles found out that his real name was William Rickard, and he just has lots and lots of pseudonyms. And uh, that November, he's absolutely desperate because all the plots he's tried to discover with the IWW and everybody hasn't worked out. He hasn't yielded very much. He needs money. And he's um, under a lot of pressure, as indeed the whole intelligence agency was. Um, so he's going around in Sheffield, where he got to know Walter Hill. And he also went to Arthur, uh, found Arthur McManus in Liverpool. And then he arrived at Alice Wilton's house in Pear Tree Lane, Derby, on the 27th of December, 1916 claiming he was on the run as a conscientious objector. He introduced her, her to Booth, that's Comrade Bert, and they persuaded her to write to her son-in-law, Alf Mason, for curare, to, which Alice says is for poisoning the dogs, and they said is for assassinating Lloyd George when he's playing golf. The letters and parcels were intercepted, and Alice, Hetty, Winnie, and Alf were arrested 1917. The Attorney General was Effie Smith, who some of you have probably come across in your reading. He's a friend and associate of the uh, absolutely notorious right-winger Sir Edward Carson, who'd actually threatened an armed rising against Irish Home Rule only a few years before the war. He's an absolutely brilliant lawyer, and in the play I just reproduced his speech as it, as it was actually given. Um, they didn't think it was a good idea, obviously, to have Alex Gordon in court. I mean, the, <laughs> the stage hypnotist appearance was obviously not what they thought would go down in a court of law. But they had Herbert Booth, they had him come to trial. And I showed a copy at the time of his evidence to a solicitor friend called Mike Seaford when I was doing the play. And he very quickly pointed out, from the point of view of a solicitor, how it had been doctored to appear more convincing. Gordon um, uh, went, was shipped out to South Africa, so he couldn't get involved. And uh, this is a period with war panic at its height, so... Uh, Alice, as I said, got 10, 10 years penal servitude, and she's in her 50s at this time. Winnie gets five, and Alf seven. And only Hetty was found not guilty. Um, quite quickly, 
people like Ramsay MacDonald, William Anderson, who's a Labour MP, and Philip Snowden began raising questions about this unit and um, about um, the whole way in which the thing had been conducted. And by 1917, uh, April 1917, they closed down this unit um, and um, Nicholas highly explains that the files um, of the activists were transferred to special branch because intelligence people are like historians. They can't bear to lose any information on people that they've got. So they, <laughs> they, pass it, they pass it on to special branch. Her, Alice Wilson's health really suffered from her time in prison and she died... Um, impoverished and ostracized by neighbors in Derby in February 1919 because they'd become abs an absolute scandal. That, I mean, the, the story went around the world um, and they were absolutely maligned, the family. I mean, they would, they would describe their, the fact that they weren't religious, the fact that they had advanced women views, the fact that they were leftists against the war, they were suspect, they were pretty well accused of being in league with Germany. They were, they were completely maligned. And people were frightened. People were really, really frightened in Derby. And they, they didn't want to acknowledge them. Although, to the honor of um, the principal, Reuben Farrow, of course he did, and he, um, he did his support. Alice Wilden when she came back. But her funeral um, was a very sort of bleak and bitter occasion um, in February 1919. Um, when she died, um, there was a, a description in the Derby Mercury of how the mourners stood in an oppressive silence. And um, William Wilden, who'd been in hiding because he'd refused to fight, pulled a red flag about three and a half foot square out of his pocket and it fluttered in the wind as he placed it over his mother's coffin. And then John S. Clark, who was also on the run, struggled up the slippery earth and looking down into her grave, delivered a funeral address in which he insisted that she'd been killed by a judicial murder. So they remained completely loyal, this little group. And... Um, after the, the book was um, actually published, I began to find out that the truth was even more remarkable than I'd known, because um, I followed a, a, a wrong trail. I was told by an elderly man called Albert Chapman that William Wielden um, had uh, gone to work for Burton on Trent Cooperative Society and that he knew his son and in fact he'd muddled up different Wieldens. Um, and Nicholas Hiley discovered subsequently that in fact William, who was unable to get his teaching job back because there was no way that these people could ever do their work again after this um, uh, trial, um, tried, he tried to run a dairy in Croydon and then in 1921, he went to live in the Soviet Union. He joined the Communist Party, and he took Soviet citizenship. And Nick highly found that he was last heard of living in a Russian city called Samara in 1928. Then in 1997, the KGB revealed that a British communist sympathizer, William Wilden, had been arrested on October the 5th 1937 and shot because this is the time of the Stalinist purges and foreigners were suspect. So ironically, this guy's life was one of being kind of hounded by various different forms of state. Um, Adam Hochschild in his book, which is another great book, uh, To End All Wars, records him being sentenced to shot, to be shot on Christmas Day, 1937. Well, my second mistake was to accept Raymond Challoner's statement that Hetty Wielden was engaged to Arthur McManus before the trial in 1917. 
Chloe Mason, the great granddaughter of Alice Wealdon, has um, pointed out that papers released after 1986 show Alice Wealdon did not know him in 1916. Moreover, I was to learn that the radical milieu in Derby of the Wealdons and um, their friends was much more radical, really, than I'd imagined. I think when you're a young person, you always assume that people long ago were much more <laughs> kind of conservative in their behavior, and that it's only the new generation that's ever discovered um, hmm. things <laughs> like sex, yes. Well, actually, um, it turns out that uh, uh, Hetty was uh, having a relationship with a different man in, uh, while she was uh, on trial, and that his family broke up their uh, relationship. And so she lost uh, the man that she was involved with. She um, gets married to uh, Arthur in 1919, so I kind of assumed, like Ray Challoner, well, yeah, they're kind of courting, you know, already. But actually, that wasn't the case. Um, also, the whole milieu was much more radical than I'd understood. Um, and I went with Nicholas Hiley after the book was published on uh, June the 6th, in 1986, to meet the granddaughters of Alice's socialist friend called Lydia Robinson. And Lydia Robinson was just a name who appeared at the funeral to me. I, it did, you know, Mrs. Robinson, it didn't mean anything at all. But I learned from them, they, that's Mrs. Kidger and Mrs. Keeling, that there was a very independent group of Derby women. Um, Mrs. Robinson, they, the police had already tr tried to link her with the burning of a local church, which was the suffragettes were accused of doing. And she claimed that it wasn't anything to do with the suffragettes, and the police um, were trying to discredit them. And when they came round to see her, st still stank of petrol. Well, Mrs. Robinson cut her hair short, ran a health food shop, and used to ride a motorbike and sidecar <laughs> in which she smuggled out a young man out of the internment camps, according to um, Mrs. Kidger and Mrs. Keeling. Um, so I'd really erred on the conservative side there. <laughs> I, I also learned how the memory went on, and when Frank Kidger, uh, and he confirmed this, he was sitting there, he said when he'd been courting his wife in the 1950s, He'd been warned off by, because uh, her grandmother had been Miss Alice Wilson's friend. And I, I learned also from Chloe Mason how that had gone on in her family. Her father uh, was Peter Mason, the son of Winnie. And uh, I've got 10 minutes, yes, I'll try uh, Peter Mason was the, was the son of um, uh, Winnie and uh, Alfred. And they went, he, he went to Australia, but he still had this um, real, uh, he was kind of haunted by the story of what had happened. Um, she came to see me after the book was written, and to my great delight, I discovered that she was a socialist and a feminist in Australia, um, and so was her sister, Deirdre. And she now is involved in a campaign um, which is supported by the Radical History Group in Derby um, to clear the names of um, uh, Alice Wealdon and the Masons. And it's had a really important impact in Derby. I mean, Chloe told me that actually Alice Wealdon was in some kind of local museum, you know, some kind of example of evil woman or something, and, and, until about five years ago. Well, now she's become someone who's got a plaque put up by the Civic Society <laughs> in Derby. And uh, Chloe's camp and the others' campaign is um, also having a, a, you know, a national impact. There's been reports on Alice Wealdon. And you, if you Google, you'll find... Um, it's Deirdre's partner's done this website, which is, shows the plaque. And um, 
there's um, uh, various. Well, there, there's been an, an, another book about her, um, but I think really that when when Chloe gets the evidence that she's collecting for this um, court case together, there will really be a sort of definitive collection, well, nothing's ever definitive, but nearly definitive, you know what I mean? Collection of information of all the stuff. And hopefully, Nicholas Hiley will eventually write a book about it because he really is the person who's followed all this through. Um, he was even doing it, I mean, he wrote to me in 1986 and he'd been already working on it for 10 years. So he's been researching and researching. Um, interest developed because of surveillance, modern surveillance, interest in surveillance in modern times. And in 2007, John Jackson from Open Democracy wrote on the case in History Today. Um, and he said, um, it's now accepted following the release to the PRO of MI5 documents in 1997 that Gordon, with the knowledge or acquiescence of Booth, and probably intoxicated by his own fantasies, had acted as an agent provocateur. Um, it's, uh, it is unknown how much his superiors were aware of what was going on, but again, in that 1986 article, Knight Nicholas Hiley um, provides evidence that at least some of them certainly knew. And I, being a lefty, suspicious person, <laughs> thinks that I'm sure they knew what was going on and all turned a, a blind eye because it was convenient. Um, so I, my interest in Alice Wielden really is partly because I've got involved in the family and their story, but also because... Um, I am absolutely fascinated in these interacting rebel network links and how you trace them. And um, also because of this um, whole question of how to see the state and think about the state. And I'll just end up with a quote from Stuart Hall about um, uh, how he says, one of the many tricks which the retrospective construction of tradition on the left has performed is to make the triumph of laborism over these other socialist currents the result of a massive political struggle in which the ruling class played a key role, appear as an act of natural and inevitable succession. And I think we're still living with the consequences of the perspectives which resulted from the partial eclipse of this um, more libertarian uh, strand on the left um, Lenin is no Pope or God declared Willie Paul in 1920 <laughs> Thank you mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Free timekeeping we've now got uh, a good quarter of an hour for questions and discussion so, uh, can I see that the first people are scratching their heads, so they can't tell whether they're waving or not. Yes, there. <laughs> can I ask uh, June Hannam, in how many of the houses where the Bristol women live are marked by a blue plaque? Oh. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I don't think any of the ones of the women that I've been talking about No, I mean, they've just started, they, they have done more for other suffrage women, haven't they? But. Um, not socialist women, and I think Mike was saying about how they're going to put one up to Walter Ailes, he thinks, he was telling yeah. me before. I made an application to the council uh, for a flat for Walter and Bertha Ailes' house, which is still there, the, the landlord has agreed to it, uh, I'm still waiting. That was, the application was made two months ago, but I'm still hopeful. Next question, comments? <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to, I thought it was really interesting to kind of um, put those two talks next to each other because, uh, you know, it, it, 
But obviously, as historians, when we're trying to, when we're trying to investigate a formal organisations, then there, is, there are ways of doing that. But obviously, formal organisations, even in a period of wartime or a period where there's significant repression, it gets very difficult. Investigating the social networks, which is very interesting the way you both approached it, which is to, rather than talking about so and so, although you mentioned their roles within the organisation, you recognise that the social network is really, really important. And I just wonder whether both of you would like to comment on on ways of investigating social networks, particularly social networks that have to be subterranean to survive? Well, with, with great difficulty, because I think one of the contrasts between what Sheila found and, and what I was looking at is the kind of evidence that there is. And you've probably got the evidence because they were under surveillance. Um, but if they're not, then you're sort of stuck with I think, as, as you were saying as well, you have to tease it out of, of tiny bits of information. So there's, there's the press, you might get little bits of letters left. You'd be extraordinarily lucky if someone leaves a diary or a journal or whatever. And it's quite hard to get personal material. I mean, you can follow things through censuses and you can make assumptions. But we're, I mean, I, I just feel there's so much about these Bristol people, I just don't know. Because as I said, with like Annie Tanley's husband, I'm fascinated by what he does after he comes here, as I said. And, and it's the fact that she seems to be the one who then does the job. And whether he, you know, um, I, I have no idea. Because he, he just pops up doing odd things, but you don't see him much. And it, it's hard to know, I don't know. In, in the case of Alice Wielden, it is because they intercept their letters. Um, and since I did the research, um, there have been more things deposited, which I haven't seen. So that's another reason why people need to go on doing this. Yeah, just, just one point. The reason I make this point is Evie Thompson once said something which was very uh, perceptive, and actually fairly obvious, really, but came across to be a perceptive because he was, they were, they were, some historian was looking into the history of the Luddites, and you know, they came to the conclusion they couldn't find much evidence, therefore there was no Luddite underground. <laughs> and Thompson Thompson said, well, if there was a Luddite underground and it was organised, then you wouldn't find much evidence, would you? <laughs> Yes, thanks. Can I just ask Sheila about um, Alice Wilden? Uh, she had a, you said she had a 10-year sentence in 1960, <coughs> which she was out in 1990. Was that through, you mentioned about, was that through ill health? Were the government feeling embarrassed because the war had finished? And obviously, see, there's maybe not a threat anymore, either of those few things. Or was the sentence just, well, stopped for some other reason? Um, it's a bit sort of surmised, but Lloyd George needed the alliance of these extreme right-wing people to, for, to, he was, because he wanted, he needed their support in 1916, I think. And then um, this intelligence agency that clearly had this very dodgy structure, um, was given a different head. A, ma a man called Addison was, became the head. And I think it was he who began to realize that there were a lot of really sort of very peculiar things going on in the case of people being set up, you know, like Alice. So he, he's part of the um, winding down of it. So there's a kind of stuff going on within, within the state and the, the mechanism of state. And as you say, by the end of the war, Lloyd George didn't really want to have those kind of right-wing connections at all. Addison is not so right-wing. Um, and so he's, he's beginning to, to move away from, the, from that kind of alliance, and he wants to have a more kind of liberal and left support. So, so therefore you're saying you was So he let them her. out. He, let, yeah. he gave them amnesty in a great act of mercy. Um, uh, to Alice, anyway, because of her age and her, her health had suffered from being in prison. But she dies in the influenza epidemic. Graham. Yeah, I, I used to um, work at the university settlement in the early 1980s. And, uh, 
picking up what Sheila was saying about how younger generations like to define themselves as much more lefty than anyone that could have gone before. The people on the gov some of the people rather on the governing body when I was there in the very early 1980s, their image of the past of this place was of reactionary do-gooding social work. They had no continuity of knowledge of this kind of radical strand in the history of that place and, and there's certainly a, a gap in the in the um, public image of that place and, and the and the, there could well be a pl I mean there's no plaque to this woman Toto that you were saying who who founded it which is a, a clear omission and maybe the Barton Hill History Group and the Radical History Group could sort that out by networking <laughs> or something but, but just one little thing the way that some of these strands maybe you see them just teasing through um, there was a very, very old lady, old woman, sorry, older woman, on the board when I started work there, who her main commitment, apart from being on the board of this university summer place, was the Anglo-German Friendship Society. And there was something you said about these people and, their, and, and, a, and a scandal about these people in the settlement being friendly to Germans. And it just rang a bell of... of of uh, Miss Goodbody, her name was. Her name. <laughs> <laughs> it was very interesting. interesting. Uh, yeah, and then I'm going to ask you. So, um, well, thank you both. I really enjoyed both those presentations. Uh, June, I just wondered, I mean, given you were talking about the difficulty of researching their lives because there wasn't much extent evidence, and given what Sheila was talking about, about the surveillance state that was created, I just wondered, have you looked to see whether there was any surveillance of this group in Bristol, or were they too far away from the kind of uh, axis of power to be of interest to the surveillance state? Well, that's a really good question, because no, I haven't looked to see if there's that, but I, I think they probably weren't, but I mean, um, Sheila might know. It's just that, not that, I don't know about them, but the, um, <laughs> but the woman, Swanick, yeah. Swanick is, is looked at in this Milner stuff. And I think some of the, I mean, mentioning Swanick, yeah, some of the big... Because she was anti-war. Yeah, some of the big mm. national speakers, um, Ethel Snowden, um, who, you know, was the wife of the person who was going to be the Chancellor of the Exchequer, she talks about how, especially after about 1916, 17, that when she went to speak on platforms, and she was a socialist plus a member of the Women's International League, that the chief constable was sent to take notes on the meeting and sent it back to head office, but they decided they wouldn't prosecute her because they probably thought it would be counterproductive because she was so well known and whatever. So I think those kind of figures were um, under surveillance, but I, I don't know about these local figures. And obviously the conscientious objectors, um, you know, they, they had all sorts of things said about them and there are files on them. So um, but it's, a, it's a good point. I ought to perhaps scan the public record office and see. Yeah, yeah the, uh, that's a bit related to, to the point that I wanted to make. The public record office is absolutely amazing because you know how we have this notion of the, the police is general very thick and you have notion of them there, licking their pencil and writing it down and not being able to grasp the difference between the different tendencies. I was a, an, an anarchist in, in the 1960s and there was a, a plod who came to our meetings. We had a meeting about education uh, and he suddenly, he suddenly started going on about how there ought to be much more state control of education, which was clearly he'd got his communist, his anarchist <laughs> manual kind of muddled, muddled up. Um, but, but I also think that we, we absolutely should not underestimate, uh, and there's a very good book by a woman called Evelyn Lovers, I don't know if we've got a copy of it here tonight, oh, Roger's going to demonstrate, uh, about, about the, the, secret, the secret state and the surveillance, uh, and, and that it's much more extensive uh, than many people think, and it's not paranoid to think that, that we are constantly under surveillance. But also at the same time, I'm going to quote Lenin in a positive way now, um, as he uh, is the opposite to what Sheila was saying. I mean, sh somebody was actually going on to Lenin I about... I was quoting really Paul. Oh, OK. <laughs> but Lenin came out of it badly. OK, so this, in this case, it's about uh, how somebody's saying to Lenin, so-and-so is an Okrana agent, uh, and, and, he, and, you know, and it's terrible. It's a, but, but he sells loads of 
papers. He does a load of stuff. So actually, quite often, uh, so long as one uh, it doesn't give them the, 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 the important information about that you're going to poison the prime minister, uh, it doesn't do, do any good to be uh, stop your activity on account of how the state uh, is watching you because they are going to be watching you. But you have to keep on keeping on, really. Okay. I I just got a, a thing about Arthur McManus, who was being uh, then surveyed in the Soviet Union, which is quite funny. Um, it's it's an account of uh, uh, poor old Arthur McManus. He got wheeled out to condemn the workers' opposition, the, who were the left communists agitating for workers' control, and. Um, he was also, uh, as a report by Claude Mackay, who was with him at a party in Moscow. Um, and, and Claude Mackay says that he, he was swaying like a tipsy little imp and accusing a clerk in the Department of Investigations and Arrests of being a spy. This is in Moscow. Spy, spy, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going home, spy. When he was told to stop insulting real communists and go back home, McManus shouted, I'm not a communist, I'm an anarchist, whereupon a comrade clapped his hand over his mouth and lifting him up like a kid carried him from the room. <laughs> okay. okay, if we've got uh, other points, we've got some, some more time. Yeah, do you want to say hello to the about Chloe? Mason. Yes. Yeah, so, Joe Mason's campaign to clear Alice Wilder. I just want to make a couple of facetious comments to begin with, because uh, I think a lot of people I've got, somebody I know found, found out a little bit about Alice Wilder, and um, this sketch came from a London, remember, in World War One group, and they, they, said, um, they said, well, he was a butcher, so maybe she was doing the right thing. <laughs> Well, that's one point of view, but uh, I mean, I think what's important is to fight the ways in which these people were treated in the past, um, because it has a continuing resonance in the ways in which history is given as, a, as you know, as an official version of what um, we're meant to believe. And so I think it's important to... Um, what you know, I mean, Chloe is trying to do it through a legal thing of the clearing of the name, but at the same time, there's, there's the other side of that, which is to actually uh, give people the other version of what was going on. Um, and um, I mean, I honestly, I, I really think there's no question of Alice Wilden being involved in a plot to, to assassinate anybody. I mean, she's somebody who, she hadn't shown any signs of trying to assassinate people. The trial is a complete farce. And um, it's a, the accusations against her are, are so completely preposterous. It's not a serious issue that she was trying to assassinate Lloyd George. She might be trying to break the um, Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And she was helping people who were on the run because she was opposed to the war which in fact was illegal and they could have charged her with that but they wanted some sensational case for whatever reasons which are very difficult to fathom but may well have been you know partly because the war effort was going not very well so it was convenient to the powers that be but also on a, on a kind of micro scale that these little intelligence agent people who were grubbing around for bits of money um, wanted um, the perpetuation of their um, source of income. In a very well, surely, kind of... surely Alex Gordon must have come up with something fairly, I mean, ridiculous for starters, but something fairly substantial in his own imagination that would lead them to setting her up on that charge initially. Well, what he had was the, the curare that was sent. I mean, yeah. the curare was definitely sent because... But the version of why it was sent was, was opposing, because Alice Wielden said it was for the dogs. And there is a letter in which um, Alf Mason actually refers to 
what effect it would have on dogs in the um, material that survived. But nothing came But up. that was ignored. Did, did nothing came up in the trial that was supplied by the agent to Alex Gordon to say that he witnessed them talking about, you know, killing Lloyd Wood? Well, there, were, there was this uh, very absurd thing that they, there's a song called, you know, we'll hang Lloyd George on a sour apple tree. And that's an old song that people sang to the tune of John Brown's body in America. And I heard actually in a local history um, meeting here in Bristol that this hanging on a sour apple tree is even older than the John Brown you know, song um, in the Civil War. So it was, a, it was a kind of thing that people sang, like people on demonstrations used to, um, you know, make remarks about Enoch Powell or Thatcher. So it, there was an incantation that is, is from uh, this old song. So this was said to be a sign that, there, that you know, that were there were these people plotting to assassinate Lord George. So they just put everything together that people said that was coincidental evidence that they could. And Basil Thompson, who was from the um, special branch, was uh, extremely skeptical about this case. But they, the police then investigated and they managed to get some more evidence that they could put to court. And the um, Effie Smith is an sardonic, cold, brilliant, cutting prosecution. And they had a, a man who um, was, was not at all experienced who was on, you know, defending them. So they didn't have very good defense. <laughs>